Looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com/get100 and use code get100. That's code get100 at prizepicks.com/get100. For a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Good morning. I'd like to start this episode by expressing my sadness for the passing of the queen. I would also like to res- express my respect for the queen and our new king. I express my condolences to the royal family and all those around the world mourning her in their own ways. I've thought long and hard about postponing this week's episode of the podcast, but I've decided to go ahead as the podcast episode may bring some much needed support and inspiration to my listeners. Welcome to the 8th episode of the Meet the Mancunian podcast season 3. I'm Deepa Thomas Sutcliffe, host of the Meet the Mancunian podcast, which introduces listeners to inspirational Mancunians making a difference in the local community. whether they run a charity or a social enterprise volunteer or coach others host a community or go it alone all my guests have fascinating stories to tell sit back relax and listen in to season 3 of the meet the man kevinian tune in to your favorite podcasting platforms every tuesday looking to help the homeless overcome poverty we hear from harry dwan fundraising and advocacy lead master tree in this episode I'm delighted to introduce my guest Harry Dwan, fundraising and advocacy lead for Master Tree. Thank you so much Harry for joining me today. Oh, thanks Deepa. It's an absolute pleasure and I'm really flattered to be on. Really excited to learn about all the great work that you and Master Tree are doing. So, Harry, you work for Master Tree and can you tell listeners about what Master Tree does? Yeah, thanks Deepa. So Mustard Tree is a homelessness, poverty and inequality charity uh, based out of Greater Manchester. We've been going for close to 30 years now and what we're passionate about is combating poverty and preventing homelessness. So as a charity, we provide lots and lots of short-term solutions to problems that come about typically because of financial issues. So that would be support with food, with clothing, with toiletries, with furniture and then advocacy, triaging and support. help with access to benefits leave to remain in the UK and um, helping try to get people into accommodation now there isn't any accommodation right now but trying to get people into it uh, the long term support is classes clubs training and activities um, arts music drama and then things like it skills and then the freedom project which is a work skills and employability program uh, as a charity we believe people are inherently brilliant We believe everyone has an incredible potential uh, but they just need a level of support or equity or almost a ladder that them get to the point where they're able to live up to their own potential. To that end, we want to treat everyone with as much dignity and provide as much opportunity as we possibly can. So for example, instead of having a food bank, we have a food club which is as close to a Tesco extra as we can afford to get. Uh, instead of having um toiletries and second-hand furniture, We accept donations of the best stuff we possibly can, as close to or brand new, and then donate onto people that have just got an accommodation, because we don't believe that your circumstances mean you should have access to less or worse off than members of the public who aren't in the same position you are. Uh, as a charity, we support rough sleepers, asylum seekers, refugees, and then people at risk of falling into poverty and homelessness. Now that's a bit of a misnomer, because of course in uh, August of 2022 we're all one bad decision or one energy bill hike away from falling into poverty and homelessness but for most of the tree that means people who may be on low income uh, benefits pensions and as we're unfortunately seeing now with the cost of living crisis more and more clients who are working full time on good or decent incomes 
and they're just having to choose between heating and eating. Thank you so much for sharing that. I did have one question about what you just talked to us about. What do you mean by advocacy tri- triage, please? Uh, so advocacy and triaging is uh, immediately meeting clients when there's a unique need. Uh, so a lot of the service the charity provides is helping people access other services. It sounds a bit silly, but it means helping someone get access to the benefits they're entitled to, mm. helping someone into accommodation or to book a GP appointment, uh, helping someone get registered uh, uh, to go to school. Um, when we say advocacy, that's advocating on behalf of someone in those circumstances. So one of our support team might sit down on the phone with the Department for Work and Pensions or the Job Centre and say, hi, I'm here with Harry. He is who he says he is. I'm a charity worker. We want to get him access to universal credit, that sort of thing. Uh, triaging is about uh, uh, clients who come in that might be intoxicated, uh, might be in the middle of uh, a mental health episode, mm. neurodiversity, or, or, or frankly, sometimes far more serious cases like uh, domestic violence or suicidal ideation. And then the support team's role is to meet them, make them feel as comfortable as they can and help them in whatever way they can. We umbrella that as triaging. Okay, thank you for explaining that. Tell us about how you found your passion for helping the homeless. Well, it's um, when I was at university, like a lot of people, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I had no idea about where my life was going, especially because I was studying politics and it felt like either you become a politician or you go work in Sainsbury's, really. And um, in my third year, just before I'd handed in my dissertation, a friend reached out and told me um, they had a friend who had a friend who had a friend who knew someone at this charity called Mustard Tree. And so my obvious reaction was like, Mustard Tree, what do they do? That doesn't tell me anything. Uh, but I was completely aimless. Uh, I went along to a tour there and I didn't realize how um, important this was until I started working there. But the CEO actually took me around and she gave me a 20 minute tour of the charity and then did something that our CEO Joe does a lot, which is sat down and goes, right, what do you do your life then, Harry? Sort it all out. Let's solve your problem now. And uh, just asked me a bunch of questions about myself and uh, what I wanted to do. Uh, Long story short, by the end of it, I was really motivated by the way that Mustard Tree uh, uh, interacted with clients, the way that it kind of had this overarching ethos that everyone was inherently brilliant and that the guise of the charity was to help everyone realize how brilliant they were, live up to their own potential. Uh, So I started volunteering uh, through the end of my third year at university and through getting a part-time job in their job club which is Mustard Tree's CV building sort of cover lettery interview session. Uh, I did okay. that for about a year and then got lucky enough to go for a job interview, which I didn't get at Mustard Tree, but then they very kindly um, created a graduate role for me. And uh, I started there as the volunteering and activities coordinator. So um, members of the public giving up time and then courses and classes, and things like that was my MO. Well, that's so interesting. So it started... Right from college and then, you know, through your volunteering, you got involved. And then specifically, tell us about your current role with uh, Master Tree and how long have you been with them? So I've been at Master Tree for two and a half years, but I've been the fundraising and advocacy lead for about three or four months. Uh, The fundraising side of my job is geared around supporting the individual and community donors. So brilliant members of the public who want to give up their time to do a fun run or set up a regular donation, sit in a baked bean bath, all that classic stuff. And then the community side is about supporting and helping motivate independent businesses, uh, book clubs, fun runners to give to Mustard Tree, either regularly or as one-off donations. So for example, we've got a big event coming up in October, which is a tough mudder. And part of my job has been helping people register, practice, understand what they'll be doing and fundraising for it. Uh, As a charity, we do our best to try and represent Greater Manchester whether that's with the clients we support or with the donor base we have, uh, people we listen to and the decisions we make. So part of my job now is to build up enough of a recurring donor base that we can have a bit more legitimacy when we say we do things like represent Greater Manchester or, or, or maybe want to live up to our own theory that people really do want to help in the city, that collectivism really is alive and well and lots of other people want to support each other in GM. Uh, the advocacy side is more to do with Mustard Tree's long-term policy changes. 
So the charity overall tries to be very preventative, prevent people from falling into poverty, falling into homelessness. You might argue that the ultimate preventative measure is for someone to not have to rely on or access Mustard Tree or a similar charity at all, which means things like strong public services, quality education, sustainable employment, green practices, solid public housing. So our advocacy side is um, trying to make changes on a policy level, either in Greater Manchester or nationally. So thanks so much for sharing about that. I'm going to just go back a little bit on what you just said. So you you said something very interesting when you talked about the individual's part of it, and I'm just, uh, I thought it would be interesting to talk about it. So you said there are people who are raise funds through interesting things such as sitting in a baked beans bath. Are there a few such examples you could give us? And then I have a follow-up question after that. <laughs> uh, most of them are quite uh, most of them aren't quite as silly. So we get a lot of people doing sponsored walks or sponsored runs. Um, a lot of little community groups doing like sponsored quizzes or gallery nights or fashion shows in aid of mustard tree. Uh, predominantly though, the baked bean bath it only happened once about two and a half years ago at the start of COVID. A gentleman did it to fundraise for us, uh, raised mustard tree a couple of hundred pounds. But most of the time it's uh, relative, at uh, least small businesses or members of the public who are doing things like um, endurance tests. So for example, a gentleman recently did a 55 kilometer ultra marathon for us to raise money. Uh, and a corporate partner wow. of ours recently did the three peak challenge to raise money. It's, uh, we're very grateful, but it's unfortunately <laughs> never as And fun then you talked about an bets. upcoming event, uh, Tough tough Mother, is that what you said? Yeah, so it's a bit of a endurance challenge fun day out where the goal is to complete different obstacles and basically get yourself covered in mud. Uh, so it's not something mustard trees ever done before, but we felt like it would be a really good way to motivate people to donate if someone they knew was, you know, having to overcome ridiculous obstacles and uh, crawl through mud and jump through ice water and that sort of thing as part of the obstacle course. Uh, but it's also a really good way we thought of building Mustard Tree's name out a little bit. Uh, I've got this a picture in my head of everyone at the start line who's uh, running or taking part in aid of Mustard Tree, all wearing Mustard Tree t-shirts. And I've just got this picture that we can take of them all and use it for branding. Uh, whilst the money and the funds that we raise and we motivate through the activity will be massively beneficial for the charity. I love the idea of the uh, the comms or the communications of it being able to say, look at how many that people That does sound really powerful. Help. And again, like you said, leveraging the community. That's so interesting. Have there been some significant challenges that Mustard Tree has faced in the time you've been with them uh, that you have any lessons you can share with the podcast and listeners? Yes. So funnily enough, my first day at Mustard Tree, uh, March 23rd, was the day that lockdown was announced. So we uh, immediately had to go into a war footing and immediately completely change what the charity did. Uh, so when we talk about Mustard Tree as an organization, it is predominantly lots and lots of long-term focus, which we as a charity call preventing homelessness, which is your classes and your courses and your training, mixed with a growing number of short-term services, which we call combating poverty. Uh, short-term services are your food, your clothing, toiletries, furniture, uh, things that will solve an immediate problem but don't necessarily contribute to long-term success. So uh, that's not really true. It's more about the short-term services we provide, build a foundation for people, and then the courses and the training allow people to build off of that foundation, maybe uh, live up to their own potential. So first off, under the pandemic, we weren't able to run any of our courses or classes because we weren't allowed to have people in the space. So that meant that half of the charity and the major focus on development and opportunity wasn't able to operate at all. So we tried to transition that online, but then what we discovered was that the majority of the people we supported didn't have access to internet or tech to be able to participate. So challenge number one was how do we reach a group that isn't allowed to be in our space and doesn't have the finance or the technical know-how to be able to set up equipment to be able to participate? That was really difficult. Um, the other problem with the pandemic, and it seems <laughs> kind of silly to say there are a million problems with the pandemic and there still are, but the other major 
transition mustard tree had to go through was only really being able to do food. So the charity has a community shop and a cafe with lots of clothes and toiletries and furniture. And then, of course, teas and coffees and paninis in the cafe. Mm. But we had to close all of that down as per government and council orders. And all we could do was deliver food to people. So the charity transitioned over COVID into something that focused on delivering 150 food parcels a day out to people in Greater Manchester. However, we did stay open, which meant that a lot of other charities that didn't have mustard tree space or its staff or its resources had to either temporarily close or move to appointment only. And that meant that the rough sleeping and asylum seeker and refugee clients that they typically supported came to us instead because we were open for food, nothing else. But you could still come in, get your food parcel, do your food shopping and have a tiny bit of a chat. Uh, However much chat was legally allowed. I'm sure we could say hi in passing as you walk by, but you weren't allowed to stand there and have a coffee with us. It was very, very strict. So the difficulty then was when we were able to legally reopen safely, how do we maintain the support for this new group of clients that we've never really had to look after in such numbers before, whilst also trying to reopen the long term training services of the charity? Uh, that was really tough. And then, of course, now with cost of living, with uh, uh, the, re- oh, God, I don't know how many crises you want me to name here. Uh, the climate crisis, the Ukrainian crises, cost of living crises, fuel, food, housing crises. We're just dealing with more people than we ever have before. Uh, so one uh, a difficult statistic is that in March of 2020, our food club, and of course, the charity does a lot more than just food, but our food club is our, uh, it's the best way to figure out what the need and demand in the city is because people talk with their feet. Our food club saw 100 people a week. Uh, as of June this year, we see 1,500 people accessing our food club a week. Uh, we, yeah, no, it, it's outrageous. And lots of people in public sector jobs, lots of people who are working full time. Not only are we now dealing with more rough sleepers, asylum seekers, destitute asylum seekers and refugees, but we're also having to support more and more people who are working full time that just because of the cost of fuel or food or housing have to make a choice between heating and eating or eating and clothing their children or eating and paying the rent. So they're now registering as clients at Mustard Tree. So the biggest difficulty we have right now is just meeting that demand financially by providing enough food, clothing, toiletries, furniture and support into accommodation as we can. But also amongst the staff team, I think it's morale, because whilst the client numbers grow, incidents grow, uh, serious cases grow, uh, uh, clients with complex backgrounds and difficulties grow. And all the while, someone who was rough sleeping a year Mm -hmm. ago is now still rough sleeping, but in a worse position because they have less access to opportunity, less likelihood that they're going to get into accommodation. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't have... Thank you for sharing those. I, I, I can understand this is a lot. Uh, there's a lot of very tough, complex situations you're uh, dealing with. And thank yeah. you so much for sharing those. I'm sure you're finding your own ways to work through it, uh, maybe in, collab- in collaboration with other homelessness charities. Oh, yeah, that's definitely true. So, um, of course, everyone in the sector wants to eliminate homelessness, wants to combat it, wants everyone to be accommodated, everyone to have a chance. So we work quite closely with the Booth Centre, with Coffee for Craig, uh, with Barnabas, different organisations that each do something brilliant to help people develop themselves. Uh, What we've also done over the last year or so is bring more organisations in. So I don't know if you've ever been to Mustard Tree Deeper, no. and you will have to come, and I will I will email you uh, afterwards to invite you in for a tour. Uh, but the best thing we have, apart from obviously me, is our space. And uh, yeah, sorry, I had to get one in. But um, our space, uh, our space is allows us to host lots of different organisations, uh, but it is also a space where our clients feel safe and welcome and warm and dignified. So if we can bring other organizations into Mustard Tree to either provide their support from our space or to give a tailored service to our clients so that our clients don't have to go somewhere else, meet new people, feel uncomfortable, the better. And we've done that with the Street Engagement Hub, with CGL, which is a drug and alcohol service, uh, with Caritas, who runs some English language classes for us, uh, and more recently with um, the Greater Manchester Tenancy Union, to provide support and advice and training to some of our asylum seeker and refugee clients. I think partnership is a good solution to provide as much support as we can, 
But the only real solution we'll have is if we see re- real change on either a Greater Manchester or national level. Thank you for sharing that. And we have uh, interviewed Coffee for Craig before on the podcast, but uh, some of the other charities also sound uh, like they're really great guests. Um, what impact would you say you've made so far? I know there's been a lot of tough times, that, but I'm sure there's a lot of good impact that you've been able to make as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's easy to just talk about demand and numbers and need and forget successes. Um, one thing Mustard Tree does, and and there are, frankly, deeper, there are small successes every day. Uh, like anecdotally, on um, Friday last week, we had a gentleman break down in tears because we were able to deliver him a bed. Uh, each day we get someone registered to access the charity and access our services is a success because it means that they now have consistent access to food, clothing, toiletries, consistent access to training and development if they want it. Sometimes just making eye contact with someone and having a coffee is enough to improve their day. Uh, or just asking someone how they are or sitting down with them for five minutes. Or in the case of the um, increasing number of children we're supporting, just being a bit silly and playing with them for a minute. Uh, but in a grand sense, um, one of the uh, services Mustard Tree provides, one of the training avenues, is something called the Freedom Project. And the Freedom Project is a life skills and employability program, kind of like supported work experience for people that want to develop. Uh, So we offer that currently for things like pat testing, which is electronic repair, in our training kitchen, in our cafe, our retail and the food club for customer service skills, uh, and then warehouse and the vans for people that want to do a bit of lifting and shifting. And all the while we see more people struggling, we constantly have success stories of people developing or gaining qualifications or getting into full-time work or going on to further education because of the support they've been given through the Freedom Project and through Mustard Tree. That's not to say they wouldn't have been able to do brilliant things on their own, but we just want to be able to provide as much opportunity, as much equity as we can. Um, So, for example, I won't be able to give any names, but we've recently got a few people. Uh, One gentleman came to us from Iran, where he used to be a palace manager, uh, and now he is uh, just about to start a master's marketing course. Uh, Another gentleman has just gotten his uh, joinery level three and will be graduating off into a full-time role soon. Uh, and uh, a lady of ours just got hired as a chef. Uh, amazing. So, uh, yeah, like the, the turnaround rate on the Freedom Project is brilliant. And just um, anecdotally, I used to, of course, volunteer in the job club back before I worked at Mustard Tree, which is really funny because I was like 21 and knew nothing about life where people were asking me for CV advice. And I'm just squeakily there going, yeah, if you just say that you're ready and willing to work, you know, <laughs> hilarious. Uh, but um the best part about the job club, and it still is the best part about Mustard Tree, is when you sit down with someone to put a CV together for the first time, and there's someone that maybe has either been long-term unemployed or had horrific recent experiences, uh, arrived in the UK as a former doctor but now can't get work as a care worker, um, and you help them sit down and realise, either through the training and the development they've gone through with us or the charities independently, how brilliant and capable they are. And you start to ask them to list their skills and build up their CV. And suddenly they start to realize that they are fantastic and they can go off and do brilliant things and make a massive difference to Greater Manchester. And being able to see that person have that realization that they are fantastic is um, one of the best things Mustard Tree does. Thank you so much for sharing that. That it, These are really heartwarming stories. And, you know, it's so great that there's so much good coming out of the Freedom Project that you're working on. So. Thank you for sharing that. How could interested people reach out to you or learn more about your website, so, social media? Yeah, so we're on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, Twitter and Instagram are at Mustard Tree MCR. Uh, Facebook is just Mustard Tree. And our website is www.mustardtree.org.uk. However, if you have a general inquiry, like you're interested in volunteering, you know someone that could do some support, uh, or maybe you're someone I love dearly who wants to fundraise for us or donate to us, then um, uh, it'd be best if you either call us on 0161 850 or email information at mustardtree.org.uk, all lowercase or one word. Those are our most direct lines, and I look after the information inbox, so I promise I'll give you a very... Um, heartwarming and genuine response 
Thank you for that. And if somebody wants to sign up for the October event, what's the best place to do that? Oh, information at uh, the email address again, please. So as it stands, we have 23 places left for the Sunday, the 23rd of October slot. Uh, the response we've had has been brilliant and really, really reassuring, really, really vindicating. Uh, lots of individuals, lots of community partners and lots of corporate partners have volunteered themselves forward to take the plunge and do some fundraising for us. So spaces are filling up quick, but if... Uh, you email me and you're really lovely. We might be able to squeeze you in. So please do reach out if you'd like to help. Fantastic. And if, if they can't help October, I'm sure there'll be another time that you can uh, get them to volunteer for you. So that sounds really good. Or fundraise for you. What advice would you have for people looking to start a similar movement in another part of the world? Oh, gosh. Uh, so never underestimate the benefit of a good spreadsheet. Uh, Microsoft Excel, Google Sheets, or just creating a graph on paper will save you so much time. And it took me two years in this job to learn that, although don't tell my manager. So I'll, uh, it's, 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 this is a boring answer, and I promise I'll get to more fun stuff in a minute. But just actually taking the time to write down conversation history, write down interactions you've had, uh, make notes of the exact amount of donations or volunteers or names and addresses of people within GDPR reasons goes a long way in six months time where you've forgotten all of it and then you realize you're able to still offer. Uh, the, the number one bit of advice I could give to someone just looking to make a difference in the community is have a real conversation with someone. So a lot of the rough sleepers we support and, and to an extent destitute asylum seekers, uh, people in temporary accommodation or um, uh, private rented accommodation that's, that's unfurnished, are just quite lonely because like, you know, I live alone and I get lonely and I have access to a million devices and I go to work five days a week. So you imagine that uh, just sitting down, making some eye contact with, listening and having a conversation with someone makes a massive difference. And of course, on a grand sense, it shouldn't be the case that doing the bare minimum of being polite and taking an interest in someone makes their day better. But for a lot of the people we support, and I imagine a lot of the people the world over in similar circumstances, just being there to talk and being there to listen makes a big difference. Outside of that, if you're looking at getting into the uh, homelessness, poverty and inequality sector, it's uh, be judgment free. Understand that everybody is brilliant. They just need different levels of support and a lot of you treating them with dignity to help them get to the point where they're able to live up to their own potential and contribute themselves. It's, um, it's easy to dismiss people, I think, a lot of the time because of their circumstances. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you don't know what people are struggling with. You don't know what uh, uh, mental health or neurodiversity or experience or just mourning someone's had. Uh, and so I'd say take the time to listen and speak and uh, uh, really understand that just because someone might be quite grumpy with you right now doesn't mean that they don't deserve your love and support. Thank you so much for sharing those uh, many different parts of pieces of advice. And it's really interesting. And I really like that first one about documenting. Uh, that's true of anything. <laughs> that's true of any project, isn't it? Uh, especially when it takes a life of its own and gets so busy. Uh, so that's, <laughs> that's a good one. And uh, we'll try and keep it low key, but <laughs> good, good tip. Thanks for that. Uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about anything coming up in the next couple of months um, or anything that I haven't asked you about before we go to our signature questions, please. Okay, so Full Mustard Tree is an organization. Uh, and thanks for giving me the time to just speak for a bit deeper. It'll make that. Uh, but um, as an organization, the next few months are going to be absolutely crucial because with the cost of living continuing to rise or worsen and with the looming recession, more and more people are going to find themselves needing support of Mustard Tree or similar organizations, uh, needing public sector support that isn't there at a time when organizations like Mustard Tree have access to less money, because of course, if more and more people are impoverished or in need of support, less people are able to donate. So right now, the biggest, uh, what the word be, Mustard Tree will struggle to meet the demand of Greater Manchester if things continue the way they are over the next few months. Uh, so if anybody is interested in supporting us, uh, they're offering help 
or donating or giving up time or has a skill or any advice, please do reach out on the uh, um, contact details I provided earlier. Although in a more positive spin, uh, we do have some fun events coming up. So on August 18th, uh, our cafe is being transformed into a gallery and we're hosting our caretaker manager, Graham's uh, art exhibition. So uh, Graham is an incredible artist, which makes me really jealous because people shouldn't be good at more than one thing. Uh, And um, he's uh, finally uh, plucked up the courage, maybe. So no, that's not fair. That's me being cheeky. But uh, he's doing an exhibition. It would be brilliant if people are able to attend that. Um, And then on September 24th, uh, in partnership with the um, Ancoats Pop-Up, which is a local community group that uh, runs pop-up markets and galleries. We're having a big art exhibition on uh, partly at Mustard Tree and then partly at the Old Naval Yard uh, Gallery with themes around home and community and support and togetherness. And that will be featuring a lot of our clients' artwork. So uh, something I haven't mentioned is uh, amongst the courses and the classes and the training that Mustard Tree does, we have textiles, creative writing and art classes. Um, We provide them because we believe people should just be able to access creative programming whenever they want. So we just provide the platform and the tools and let people basically crack on. There's no expectation of uh, uh, maybe development. There's certainly no expectation of payment or seeking support. Just come in and use our stuff. And people create some brilliant things. And we want to be able to highlight the skill and the talent of people in Greater Manchester that might traditionally or literally be overlooked and dismissed and disenfranchised. So we'll be doing that in September. Uh, Look out on Mustard Tree's Twitter and Instagram for more information about both of those. Uh, And I think that's everything off the top of my head. I hope our events manager doesn't uh, uh, hear this and realise I've forgotten something important. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure sure you've covered the big ones coming up and people can always uh, follow (laughs) you on Twitter or on Facebook or on your website to, to learn more, can't they? Yes, absolutely. And we'll, uh, if you drop us a message, we'll definitely respond because we're still quite small, especially nationally. We're uh, only in Greater Manchester. We've got one site in Anchor, it's two sites in Salford. Uh, so we've still got that beautiful sort of, uh, 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 what would the word be? Like, if you send us a message, we'll respond within like 15 minutes because we're just grateful someone's messaged us. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that as well. So, Harry, now it's the time to it is meet the Mancunian, so we have signature questions for our guests. So what do you love the most about Manchester? Oh, uh, that's a really horrible question. Uh, I think what I love the most about Manchester is that it's really unafraid to be itself. So every time now, and um, I'm almost a tree site in Anco, so I get the tram. So I walk from Ancoats through Northern Quarter, through Piccadilly, down to St. Peter's Square. And I am still to this day shocked by how open and comfortable everybody is. People dress how they want, people act how they want, people are themselves. And I think we foster the culture in Greater Manchester where we celebrate differences and we celebrate uh, uh, people that uh, maybe have been overlooked before and people that maybe haven't had the spotlight. I think that's beautiful about Manchester. I mean, we've got pride coming up. That's going to be a massive chance for people that might otherwise sometimes not quite get the attention they deserve being praised and being celebrated and being, you know, uh, waved at during the float. Um, I also love the architecture. Maybe that's a cop out, but I love old Victorian mills and buildings. So it's always really pretty to walk through. And then I think the final thing, or I love everything about the city, but the the final thing, apart from making a joke about loving the uh, the pubs and the bars and the clubs would be, how easy it is to find somewhere that's green as well. Like uh, I've just moved out to slightly south of Manchester and it is amazing how beautiful and green the space is. Where you've got a city centre that is thriving. Wow, I just made a word up there. It is vibrant (laughs) and thriving and full of life and full of industry and full of successful independent businesses. Uh, And then you come out 20 minutes and it's green. Although I do want to say one thing, although I'm saying this one with my uh, mustard tree hat on, so I apologise in advance. But my uh, favourite thing about Manchester is how committed to supporting each other the residents are. So whenever the staff team feel a little bit at mustard tree, feel a little bit maybe dejected or demotivated or upset by something that's happened that day, or maybe we feel like the weight of the world is not getting better and nothing's improving and then things getting worse, 
I'll get a email or I'll get a notification or I'll check some donations. And we'll have just had someone who, instead of asking for wedding gifts, has just given it all to Mustard Tree. Or someone that's decided that instead of getting their pocket money, they're just going to give it to charity. Or a local pub or business or walking group that has decided that this day or this week, what they're going to do is donate to us. And that, uh, or, or volunteer with us or support us, or, or as someone did yesterday, drop off a lot of old um, cat beds and one of those like tall scratchy ramp things that cats use, people will always surprise you with how generous and willing to help they are. And I think, I think that ties back into this idea that we celebrate differences and we understand people and we celebrate culture and uh, uh, neurodiversity and diversity in general is that people really are lovely. People really are brilliant. People really do just want to help each other in Greater Manchester. I found that myself, uh, as I told you, my, I'm brand new in the city and I've met all these amazing guests, including yourself, through my other guests. So there is a real community who's out there to help people succeed. I really enjoy that. Yeah, I found that when I was a little bit at a loss recently, uh, so uh, not to talk about work again, but Mustard Tree are going to start doing some climate stuff, going to start doing some green things, sustainable practices and that. And I was at a complete loss of where to start. And I found all these brilliant people, uh, organizations, uh, uh, cooperatives and community interest groups like uh, Plastic Shared and Stitched Up and um, oh, Manchester Urban Diggers, and loads more that I apologize, I can't remember off the top of my head, but you're all brilliant, who were so willing to help just from a professional capacity. Like, come for a coffee and we'll talk you through how it works. Like, everyone really does just want the city to be brilliant. And I think that's really, really reassuring. I'm making a mental note of some of these names and I'm going to catch you. <laughs> but uh, oh, come no. <laughs> back, to the, back to the question. So where's your favorite place in Manchester? Ah, oh, my favourite place in Manchester. So uh, other bars are available, but I do find I go to Crown and Kettle in Ancoats, Cutting Room Square or Flock in Stevenson Square quite a lot after a hard day of work. Uh, they're all bars and pubs, so, you know, um, results may vary. But I find that they're beautiful places. Um, I love the uh, Whitworth Gallery in Alexander Park. I love the Rylands Library. I love um, St. Peter's Square. I think it's so, uh, I don't know, it's like oppressively gorgeous. You've got the old library and the old town hall opposite some new built uh, um, office buildings with the tram running through it. Um, on the tram journey as well, uh, you go through, there's this part just after, oh, just after Trafford Bar, you basically look at all of the construction happening in Trafford over almost like a viaduct. And it's uh, so impressive to see the city developing. Although that's that's a really hard question, that deeper. I'm, I'm not I'm not sure what my favourite spot is. Uh, <laughs> I know what, it is hard. What's your favourite spot? Ooh, what's your favourite spot? That's really hard because I've only been here for a short while. But I'm going to probably go with something like Quarry Bank Mill. I don't know if it's still Greater Manchester or not, though. Oh, we can count that. Oh, I'll tell you what. Um, when I was a student... I used to always sit underneath the Vimto statue on Granby Row. Do you know where that is? No. Ah, uh, you'll have to go. So um, up sort of just past Piccadilly Station, there's uh, student accommodation, Granby Row. You just kind of sit under there and there's a giant homage to the of Vimto, because I guess Vimto is from Manchester. <laughs> that always made me laugh. Okay. Is this Vimto the drink? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Can... Okay. <laughs> No, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Manchester has got its quirky and its serious and its uh, history. It's really interesting to see some of the local history take place. So, I mean, to kind of discover that local history. So, What's the most important life lesson you've learned? Uh, get over your own ego. Uh, that's it. Um, I, with, even now and there's always an egotistical part of my brain that wants to be the only one to succeed at something or wants to do something independently or be the one that came up with the new idea. Just let go of that because it's ridiculous and it's childish and it doesn't help. Uh, so I found accepting, I don't know, maybe that sounds really silly, like uh, understanding that everyone's on the same side and it doesn't make you less capable or less intelligent to want to be supported by or take advice from someone else. 
uh, uh, that's personal to me. I know most people are probably less egotistical than I am, so it's not really relevant, but that's quite personal to me. Uh, the other one is uh, it's okay to have a really bad day. Uh, so if you're like studying for something or you're dieting or you're determined to go to the gym and you just have one day when you completely cave and you eat a cake or you just sit there in your underwear playing video games or something, that's fine. That's human. You're allowed to have a moment where you're just a bit silly, but don't let it stop the good work you've been doing. Uh, uh, so my personal experience is uh, if I'm on like a fad diet, I'm on like a, I'm committed to the gym. And now that I'm doing this Tough Mudder in October, I am committed. I'm determined to be really good. <laughs> but um, uh, you'd have a bad day and you'd just stop then, basically. You'd let that bad day compound. And so the next day you wouldn't get up and go for a run because, oh, what's the point? I didn't yesterday. Now just do it. You're allowed to have a day where you're a bit silly. Just get up the next day and uh, try again. I think this is both really good piece of advice. The fact that, you know, there's almost wisdom in crowds and allow people, allow the universe is listening and allow each other to help you. Uh, and I guess the second one about, you know, keeping going, it's okay to, we are all human and therefore we will fall from all our lofty goals from time to time, but kind of picking up and, and carrying on that, that, they both really re resonate very well with me. Yeah, I, I should have written something down for that. I would have loved to give a really poignant answer, but there you go. There's two off the cuff. <laughs> if someone wrote a book on your life, what would they title it? <laughs> so this is funny because uh, a couple of my friends, every time we hear like, three uh, uh like nouns in a row we'll always tell each other that's the name of your autobiography uh, <laughs> oh, oh i'll tell you what i'll i'll tell you what i'll do i'll um it will be um it will be um paisley corduroy and pints of lager the harry dwan story there you go <laughs> So Harry, thanks so much for sharing about quite a varied uh, range of topics that we've covered today. But did you have a funny story to uh, share with listeners today? Ah, oh, I hope this is funny. Uh, it was funny to me. Uh, so one of the things Mustard Tree runs is English Conversation Club. So we have our ESOL classes, which is English language classes for people that may not speak it natively. Uh, and then Conversation Club, which is like an informal version of that, where you basically sit around a big table with some coffees and have a chat. And it's actually really similar, Deepa, to what you were talking about earlier with Mank Talk, where instead of learning about, say, pronouns and tenses, as you would in a formal session, you learn about colloquialisms and accents and phrases and things that maybe you shouldn't say, but you're Mank, so you'll be taught to anyway. And... Um, <laughs> The, the greatest success of our conversation club is when people who uh, have grown up in other parts of the country or, or the planet start to sound like they've lived uh, or worked <laughs> in a Lancashire mine for 40 years. So we've got a few clients of ours who've come from uh, the Middle East, Iran, Afghanistan, um, who, <laughs> and this is true, but it shall remain nameless. Uh, one gentleman was a former soldier in Eritrea and he had quite a strong accent. And uh, he used to attend our conversation club every Wednesday, started to develop a bit more of a mank accent until ultimately one day he comes downstairs when I'm sat at reception. He puts his hand on my shoulder and goes, you're eat lad, have you got any lasses? And I just felt like that was the biggest success <laughs> because... This person had completely got to the point where they sounded more Mancunian than I do. <laughs> so, uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're going to end up with a case where every person that comes to Mustard Tree from another country ends up being more of a Mancunian than I am. But you know what? That's not a bad thing. That, that is a brilliant story. So you're obviously making impact with these conversation classes. So Harry, thanks so much for taking the time. I know you have somewhere to be uh, soon after. So 
uh, really wanted to thank you for sharing everything you did about homelessness today and all the exciting plans that Master Tree has and how the community could get involved. So I hope listeners will get back to you uh, with some ideas of how they might get involved or they might Ooh, sign yes, up please. for some of your fundraising events. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, thank you, Deepa. It, it, I've never done anything like this before, so sorry if it sounds very unprofessional, but I'm just grateful to be given the platform and the chance because it's always great to talk about mustard tree to someone that's genuinely interested, but it's also brilliant to be able to have an opportunity to advocate and make people aware of the state of the sector of mustard tree and of the support that our clients need. Also, it's just been quite pleasant to have a nice chat on a nice sunny Monday afternoon. Of, uh, it is still sunny, isn't it? Lovely. Ah, oh, it is. I mean, I, I know I'll be, I'll have shoes thrown at me for saying I quite like this heat because I know it's devastating the country, but I do quite like this heat. Like right now, I've I've got a new little dining table and I'm just sat here in the big window with my laptop having a chat with you, and it's absolutely beautiful. That sounds really good, Harry. I really enjoyed learning about helping the homeless today, dear listener. Thank you so much for listening to the 8th episode of the Meet the Mancunian podcast season 3. I know many of you are listening in from different parts of the world or across the UK. I hope this episode and the podcast itself motivates you to follow your dreams and passions. Inspired by the amazing Mancunian guests who feature here. Tune in every Tuesday for a new episode. Next week, the Meet the Mancunian talks to Frank Doyd about how he creates art and fundraises for charity. Tune in on Tuesday, 20th September 2022 to hear the next episode. Please do also consider subscribing to the podcast and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. I would also be grateful if you could share this podcast with a friend or a family member. Thank you so much.